Have you been enjoying our Impact Podcast and our great guests? Then please give us a thumbs up and leave a five-star review on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your favorite podcasts. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States, and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. This episode of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Closed Loop Partners. Closed Loop Partners is a leading circular economy investor in the United States with an extensive network of Fortune 500 corporate investors, family offices, institutional investors, industry experts, and impact partners. Closed Loop's platform spans the arc of capital from venture capital to private equity, bridging gaps, and fostering synergies to scale the circular economy. To find Closed Loop Partners, please go to www.closedlooppartners.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm John Shigarian, and I'm so honored to have with us today, Worku Gashu. He's the head of North American Inclusivity, Impact, and Sustainability at Visa. Welcome, Worku, to the Impact Podcast. John, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, yeah. And thank you for joining us today and spending the time and sharing your thoughts And before we get talking about all the important work that you and your colleagues are doing in inclusivity, impact, and sustainability at Visa, can you first share a little bit about your origin story? Where did you grow up? How you even got on this journey? And who inspired you to do the important and great work that you and your colleagues are doing now at Visa? Happy to, John. Happy to, John. I have... uh... I have a very nonlinear path uh, to where I ended up today. And so uh, I guess it all starts off uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, outside Washington, D.C. Yeah. Uh, that's where I was born and raised. My, my, my folks are still there. My, my parents immigrated from, from Ethiopia about 40 years ago. Um, and, you know, they're the epitome of the American success story, you know, came with nothing and worked hard and was able to provide for, for, for their family. And, you know, uh, ended up where I am today. You know, I, I've, I've always been fascinated by the intersection of politics and, and business um, living outside the nation's capital. And so, you know, I've always kind of found my career journey as, you know, how can you leverage the private sector to drive development and uh, impact? And so, you know, I spent about a decade on Capitol Hill, uh, where I worked for a member of Congress and worked for the Committee on Foreign Affairs, where we tried to create laws and pass legislation that incentivized the businesses in the private sector to engage in impact. And when they did, they got certain tax benefits. And uh, and with that, right, we saw an ability to utilize the scale and innovation of the private sector not relying solely on government resources to meet the impact and the development goals that we had in Africa and the Middle East and Latin America. And so from my time after Capitol Hill, I then went to a law firm where uh, I learned how you know we can really leverage this, this idea of, you know, corporate impact to help advance broader business objectives. And so at the firm I had the opportunity to work with some, you know, the world's most innovative and, and large companies to figure out, you know, what is what is their need, what is their impact story, right, and how do we apply that to some of their business goals and objectives in uh, in tough markets. I then left the law firm and I joined um, an organization called the Development Finance Corporation, which many people don't know about it, um, but it is essentially like the U.S. government's private equity firm. It's a brilliant structure. They have about $60 billion of capital, and they invest that capital in private sector enterprises. Again, going back to this theme of private sector-led development, right? 
investing in these private sector entities, right, will spur job creation, will spur innovation, will spur development around the world. And so I led uh, origination in sub-Saharan Africa, where we had about, you know, $6 billion of, of capital in the market. And we provided equity, debt, and we were a limited partner to um, a number of uh, general partners that are active in the continent. And so that was me being exposed to seeing like, you know, how we evaluate, you know, companies operating in this market, right? And and how can we find synergies between their mission, right? And the impact that we were trying to achieve. And so, you know, after my service at the Development Finance Corporation, you know, I've I've always been kind of in the periphery of private sector led impact, right? But never in house anywhere. And so when the visa opportunity came about, it was the it was the perfect kind of perfect chance to to marry up kind of all my different skill sets into one role at you know one of the world's most recognizable brands uh and that's doing you know that is at the cutting edge innovation of money movement and how long have you been at visa i've been at visa for two and a half years it feels uh, it, it feels like much longer though but, <laughs> but, but two and a half um, and, I, you know, you're a very humble guy as well, Riku. You're also an uh, adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, you know, I've always been, um, you know, I, I myself, I studied international affairs and political science in school. And I, you know, you're always told that there's a there's 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 certain paths, right? When you take certain degrees, and and you know the assumption that oh you have to go into academia or research, and and so for me, right, and 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 kind of my unique path, I really wanted to kind of take that opportunity to show you know my students and other students that you know there are unique ways in which you can apply what you're learning, you know, with the foreign policy of political science and international relations degree, right, within the private sector. And so um, I teach a course on uh, African environmental policy and looking at, you know, how do you leverage the private sector to, to, to achieve some of the environmental goals uh, that, you know, the continent and the countries on the continent have. And so, you know, for me, I, uh, this is my third year doing it. And let's say, uh, I've 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 never appreciated teachers and professors as much as stepping into those shoes. I mean, the prep and the work that goes into it. Uh, Georgetown students are are top caliber. They they, they ask some hard hitting questions, and so um, uh, it's been it's been a fun experience. I I myself am learning a lot and uh, really enjoy it. And 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 you know, as you just say, it's great that you just mentioned that you know an appreciation for our teachers and our professors. Uh, around the world, I mean, the, the responsibility that they shoulder as well, uh, you know, to try to educate our next generation is 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 not to be taken lightly. No, I I say continuously that I think it's one of the most underpaid professions in the U.S. Um, yeah. They are they are at the forefront of you know the next generation, and and how do you prepare them? How do you ensure that you know they are ready for the challenges and the opportunities that 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 they'll face um, uh, once they leave their respective institutions? And so um, I'm I'm serious. I, I I called up a few professors uh, as I as I got this appointment and was kind of like, oh crap, like what have I got myself into? Advices, pointers, right? So it's been it's been it's been fun. I sometimes feel like I'm the student myself. Uh, I think we all, if we really want to continue to evolve as good people, I think it's a great place to stay in life as just the yeah. student. Yeah. Just, yeah. Really just a great way to, it's just a great mindset to continue to have and hold at all times. Of course. Um, of course. Let's go, let's go now. Let's switch topics a little bit over to what you're doing at Visa. Now you joined about two and a half years ago. I love what we used to talk about the entry point. When you came on to head of North America in terms of titles, inclusivity, impact, and sustainability, what was pre-existing and what was a, a blank sheet of paper for you to um, create and uh, vision out and to execute upon? How much was historical? How much was literally going to be all you just laying out a new a new path forward? I I came into a blank slate. I came wow. into a blank slate. 
Um, oh. my, role, my role did not exist uh, previously. We didn't have a team. We didn't have a structure. We didn't have a budget. We had various um, various folks doing various aspects of the work. Right. But what you know, our leaders had the foresight in, in doing was 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 recognizing you know establishing my role within our corporate entity, right? Within Visa Inc., we have a separate foundation that does a lot of our philanthropic work. Okay. But with the Inc. side, it was a recognition that, you know, we can really live out our purpose mission, right? By, by leveraging the products, the services, the technologies that we have. And so, you know, I tell, I tell folks and, and, and not to, you know, uh, begrudge my 26,000 colleagues around the world, but I think I have one of the coolest jobs at Visa, right? You know, where I sit, I get to think about, right? There are these teams that are creating innovative technology at the center of money movement, right? This is what makes economies work, what makes business function. And we get to think, how can we leverage this technology or this product to achieve our social impact and our environmental impact objectives? And so, you know, it's, you know, what, what I've learned, if I've learned anything, Roku, over the last 16 or so years hosting this show is that inclusivity, impact, sustainability, even now some of these other alphabet terms, ESG, CSR, um, the shift from the linear to circular economy can mean different things at different organizations. Explain when you're doing the walking the high wire and 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 trying to balance all the interests in terms of where you spend your time and energy and have Visa spend their time, energy, and resources in terms of the importance of inclusivity, the importance of sustainability, and how to maximize the impact that you and your wonderful colleagues are making. How do you do that? How do you how do you weigh all those uh, very heavy and important topics now? that again are are really going to determine the future of our planet in many ways. How do you do that at Visa? And how did you start that balancing act? And where how has that evolved for you? That's uh that's a great question, John, and something that we thought about very carefully. And and the short answer before I get into the long answer yeah. is ensuring that everything that we're doing is aligned with Visa's broader business objectives, right? We've seen, you know, um, throughout my experience in the CSR, corporate responsibility, corporate impact world, right? Um, this, this, the, the, the function go awry when teams try to embark on areas or issue sets that are outside core to the business. Okay. And so when, when, when we develop our strategy and tried to allocate resources and team members to that strategy, we looked at our core business, right? What is its functions? And can we look at the periphery of that and, and, and identify opportunities where we could add value, right? To drive the social impact and environmental impacts that we're trying to achieve, right? And so, you know, to your point about this, this kind of alphabet soup of, of different initiatives, right? You know, we have three main pillars. First is social equity, really looking at the economic mobility of underserved populations. Then we have a pillar on financial inclusion and financial education, right? Really ensuring that people have the skills and the training they need, right? To ensure that they're 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 harnessing the digital economy. Okay. And lastly, and also just as importantly, is small businesses. I think you can appreciate the role that small businesses play uh, for the economy in North America, in the U.S. in particular, right? And so what are the tools, resources, asset, funding that small businesses need to be successful when we think about job creation, when we think about economic development? So under those three pillars, that sounds like that adds up to your driving efforts to create equitable economic growth in the United States using those three main, you know, uh, you know, uh, pillars to to be to, to to bolster you. So, how do you then manage the success and impact of in those three areas that you just outlined: social equity, financial inclusion, and small business success? So we have developed specific programming under each of those pillars, right, to advance the goals that we outlined. Okay. So. 
let me give you let me give you an example. Sure. Uh, one uh, uh, initiative under our social equity pillar is a program we have called MDI Accelerate. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, the term MDIs, but it's a it is a it's a designation that's given by the FDIC and the Federal Reserve. It stands for Minority Depository Institutions. Understood. And you get this designation if you are minority, if you're majority minority owned uh, bank institution, or if you serve a minority community predominantly. And for us, right, when I walk through these 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 three pillars, our team took a step back. And as we were thinking strategically, we we're like, where can we leverage our resources, our partnerships, right? to advance goals within these pillars. And so we identified the MDI segment as one of those areas. You know, um, many people don't know, but you know, MDIs play an integral role in providing capital and credit to communities that historically lack that access. And so think of small business loans, think of consumer loans, mortgages, affordable housing, right? They are the bedrock to it. And frankly, they've been overlooked over the years and have, and have struggled because of that. We thought we're in a unique pace, place to inject resources, both monetary, both product and solutions, all three to support them and their growth so that they can acquire new customers and retain the existing customers they have. And so through this program, we've deposited 100 million Visa Inc. dollars in a number of these, in dozens of these institutions around the US. And what's exciting is for every dollar that we place in these institutions, it catalyzes $10 of additional lending. And so we are, we are, we're, we're, we're scaling our impact, right? And getting into the communities on the front lines through FDIs. Right. I love it. I love it. And so basically it's a 10 to one ratio on the impact. So you're talking about hundred million dollars in visa uh, uh, dollars that then lead to a billion dollars in impact. That that's the goal over, over the course of the program. That is what we anticipate. And this is, and this is an R estimates, right? This is, this is estimates from scholars and others who've looked at the, the, the catalyzing impact of placing deposits in these institutions actually creates I love it. I've read about your your digital empowerment program. Can you explain what that is and uh, and what's the impact and success of that program? Uh, how has that evolved? Yeah. So so you know our, our our digital impact work falls both under our 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 SMB pillar, but then also our financial inclusion pillar as well. Mm. You know, recognizing that you know there's this idea, you know, now that financial inclusion has historically meant, you know, have you been unbanked or, or, or underbanked? Have you been excluded from the formal kind of financial ecosystem? We have a different perception. We think now you are you are included or excluded from the digital economy, right? It is it is a it's a different approach to understanding what do you need to successfully use you know your phone as your bank, right? Or your computer. And so we 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 saw the importance of addressing digital inequity. And we think of digital inequity as three pillars. First, right, is do you have the ecosystem? Do you have the access to actually benefit from the digital economy? If you have that access in place, the second piece is, do you have the products and the hardware to leverage that access? And the third piece is, do you have the knowledge and the training to benefit from that access and the products. And so looking at the spectrum of digital equity, we recognize, you know, that first bucket, the ecosystem access piece, we don't really have a place to play there, right? There's a lot of internet service providers or cable providers, others who are doing great work in this space to ensure, you know, low cost affordable access. But where we can play is within the hardware and with the training piece. And so working cross-functionally, right? Again, where I sit, I get to I get to work across our different functions. You know, we partnered with our IT team. Visa is a tech company, you know, at heart. We have a lot of tech assets, a lot of computers, a lot of hardware that we go through. So I said, could we take a small segment of our end of life assets, refurbish them, work with nonprofit partners in the community to distribute them, and alongside that distribution, provide training. And so over this past. This past year, uh, fiscal year, 
We've trained over 5,000 individuals and small businesses on how to leverage the digital economy. But because we're reusing end-of-life assets, we've also diverted 30,000 pounds of digital waste away from landfills. So it's a win-win both on the social impact side and the environmental impact side. I love it. Talk a little bit about um, your, your latest digital empowerment event that was in the Navajo Nation. Oh, what, what was that event? What were you trying to achieve there? And how did it, how did it break out and evolve? Yeah, that that was exciting one. So, you know, uh, Visa has a robust ERG group, uh, employee resource group, and we have uh, our native ERG, which uh, uh, is an ERG and affinity group for uh, Native Americans within Visa. And so, you know, we do these programs around the U.S. and in Canada, we do them in urban and rural locations. And to credit our ERG leadership, at Native, they said, hey, this is a super cool program, but you haven't done it on a reservation yet. Would you like to? Mm -hmm. And we said, that's a great idea. And so uh, working in close collaboration with our Native ERG, uh, we worked with uh, a number of organizations, uh, primarily Choice Humanitarian um, and entrepreneurs who live in the, the former Bennett Freeze area, uh, of the Navajo Nation to identify small business owners and entrepreneurs and provide them with the digital tools that they needed to be successful. Um, I think you know the the, the landscape of uh, the, the the tribal lands are quite harsh and, and quite vast, and so you know being connected to 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 the digital economy and the digital ecosystem is is key for them in terms of productivity and, and time saving. And so um, credit to our native ERG, but but it was it was it was their idea. Got it. Now, for those listeners and viewers who've just joined us, we've got Worku Gashu today with us. He's the head of North America Inclusivity, Impact, and Sustainability at Visa. To find Worku and his colleagues and all the important work they're doing in inclusivity and impact and sustainability, please go to www.usa.visa.com. You know, it's early days yet still in your tenure, Worku, but um, do you start uh, keeping a formal track of your programs, the successes they're having, uh, the vision that you have for the future, and do you wrap it up every year in an in a impact report that then lives online or is distributed to your constituents and board members and other people and, uh, and employees and other people that are uh, uh, excited to read that kind of stuff? I feel like... Uh... I feel like you've been spying on me. You know, our our the end of our fiscal year is September 31st. And so uh a lot of what myself and our broader team's been doing this past week is really aggregating and accumulating our impact that we've done over this past fiscal year. And we produce uh a, an, an annual corporate impact and ESU report where a lot of our work and a lot of our impact uh is documented and and published for the public, right? And you know, part of Part of our our metrics and our evaluation is not to you know boast about the work that we're doing, but it is to assess for us personally kind of what works and what doesn't work. You know, one of the things that that I've seen in my career in the corporate impact space is you know folks being reluctant to to stop programs that aren't working. Right? You know, you have these nonprofit relationships, you have this work you're doing, but sometimes you're not achieving the intended impact that you know, you sought out to from the start. And so being comfortable with shutting something down or slowly walking it back and, and, and being able to pivot is, I think, you know, uh, uh, an area where a lot of impact professionals, right, are are are, are hoping to spend more time. And and, and we're doing that, that, that self-reflection um, as well. Wonderful. And, when, and that gets published when then? That gets published, I believe, at the end of the year. And then that lives on uh, usa.visa.com website. Yes, sir. yes it does. Wonderful. You know, you were talking, we were talking a little bit a while ago about the Navajo, Navajo Nation digital empowerment event and, and success there. Are you planning to expand uh, digital empowerment programs in more cities and communities around the United States and North America specifically? Yeah, yeah. Like we take, um, 
we take a pretty strategic approach, right, in terms of like where we identify markets and 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 communities, right? Looking at where is you know where the needs are, right? Um, we have a number of resources and and data abilities where you know we see you know that there is ecosystem here, that there is access, but people aren't utilizing it. So is it because they don't have the equipment or they don't have the training? If they have the equipment, then we know it's a training problem. And so, you know, through through some deductive reasoning, you know, we try to really hone in on the areas where, you know, our impacts can drive the intended outcomes that we're striving for at scale, right? You know, Visa is ubiquitous and, 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 and we try to, to be, you know, um, present in a lot of markets. And so the one thing that I always have to take a step back and think about is 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 scale, right? And, and how do we operate at the at the scale that we are that we are known for and, and expected for? That's interesting. You know, you, your specialty is incl- inclusivity of stakeholders, government, good government, NGOs, and good business, and good business, responsible business leadership. Talk a little bit about your own thoughts on the critical nature of these kind of partnerships working together to further DEI and CSR work and why really when you get all the stakeholders involved, you could do more with less, you could go farther uh, with, with, with less, and you can make bigger impacts uh, in, in a shorter period of time. What's some of your thoughts on how you aggregate and enable the stakeholders to be less polarized and be be more collaborative. I mean, uh, it's a it's a great question, John, and it's something that I saw from my time in government. Right, you know, I was on the other side of the table and right. recognizing that you know, government resources, even though people think they're plentiful, uh, they're actually you know, there's a dearth of it focused on. The development and impact, right? That I think everyone anticipates or, or expects for their community, and so recognizing this, right? We try to bring in a lot of stakeholders, private sector, nonprofits, and others who are doing this important work in government. Now, when where 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 I sit at Visa, right? You know, I think about okay, what are the resources that we have, right? Um, earn wage access, so people that are in the gig economy can get paid for the day of the, for the work they've done that day, right? Um, or other solutions around, you know, um, um, Visa Direct, right? Where, 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 where we can help people with account to account transfers, right? These, this, this, this new approach to, to, uh, to, you know, the economy and, and how money moves. And so, you know, we like to position ourselves in a way where we will bring our unique tools, our unique offerings, right? And sit with partners, nonprofits and governments to help advance a collective goal. So let me give you another kind of concrete example and and instead of speaking theoretically, right? You know, we partner with FEMA closely on disaster response. Mm. FEMA uh, FEMA is the US government's, you know, disaster response agency. And when a disaster strikes, there is a real need to understand which places are operational so that FEMA and other first responders can know which stores to acquire goods, gasoline, and other products for in their response. Visa has the ability to see which merchants are online and or offline based off of whether they're processing transactions or not. And so we developed a model and a map where after disaster strikes, we call the back to business locator, we'll, we'll, we'll activate the tool and we can see which businesses are operational and we provide that data set to FEMA to help a, a, a orderly and expedient response to that disaster. Wow, I love it. Um, you know, you're still relatively young in your, first of all, relatively young as a human being, but also n- new in your tenure at Visa. What do you use for, on, on, on this? This is a two part question for your work. Who, a, what inspires you today to continue to do the great work you're doing with your colleagues? And B, what do you use as benchmarks? Do you c- clearly look at the obvious benchmarks of com- competitive brands in the credit and debit space? 
or do you look outside of that um, at a wider breadth of benchmarks for different types of organizations and corporations around the world and what they're doing in inclusivity, impact, and sustainability to further inform you and inspire you at the same time? Yeah, um, there are a lot of folks that I look at that that, that inspire me and, and guide me. I think, you know, for me, what inspires me is, is you know, my time early on in my career, right? When yeah. I was on Capitol Hill and focused on, you know, African development issues. And I, I, I saw the power of, you know, telling someone that, hey, I don't want to give you a handout, but I want to invest in you because I see opportunities because because I see, you know, what opportunity lies ahead for you and your skills. And so mm-hmm. for me, I think back to how, you know, placing that 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 confidence in that entrepreneur, right? Or that small business owner in Kenya, right? How 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 they took that vote mm-hmm. of confidence mm-hmm. and support not only their family but the broader community, right? And so it is it is always remembering that that you know, there is a beneficiary at the end of the st- at the end of the strategy documents, right. and, and the discussions with your finance team and securing resources, right? Not, you know, not forgetting sight of 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 that beneficiary that that you're trying to impact and improve the livelihood of themselves and their family. There's uh, a real tangibility to your impacts. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. In terms of looking at at um, others and, and and benchmarking, I. I personally, I try to look outside of the payments and financial services world, right? You know, there, there, there sometimes can be this, this, this bubble effect echo chamber, right? Where everyone's talking about the same issues, everyone's trying to bring forth the same resources. And, and you know, what, what I found is if you take a more holistic approach to your benchmarking and to your learning, right? You know, I, I, there's, this space is still being defined, right? There's still a lot of literature. There's still a lot of uh, scholarly journals that will be written about this this past few years of, of, of corporate impact, right? I try to think holistically about what folks are doing in different sectors uh, and, 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 and how they're looking at their impact. For example, Patagonia and the work they've done around sustainability and the environment, wow. far none, some of the impressive stuff we've seen. You know, the... Um, the idea uh, uh, to invest in uh, MDIs, right, actually came from Netflix. Uh, they were they were one of the early pioneers, uh, the CEO of Netflix, who said, "Hey, this is a segment that I think is important. We have some capital, and 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 let's deposit that capital uh, in MDIs, right?" And so I try to think holistically of of you know in with sectors outside of you know our 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 traditional kind of vertical of payments and financial services. Understood. Um, with, with regards to what's next at Visa, what gets you out of bed? What makes you jump out of bed in the morning that you're allowed to talk about in terms of forthcoming projects and initiatives that uh, really get you jazzed? That you're allowed to talk about? Uh, I I, get you yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, uh, yeah. I'd love to have a job tomorrow, John. So, so I don't want to get ahead of... Uh, uh, Ahead of my skis here. Um, what are there's? We have a lot of interesting stuff cooking. We have a lot of interesting stuff cooking. You know, we, um, for example, right? You know, we talked about uh, looking at you know minority depository institutions as an important segment. We place assets in these institutions, right? We also want these assets to be working, right? We want these small community banks and credit unions to be underwriting uh, um, underwriting loans and, and, and uh, credit leveraging this capital, but they're using a lot of antiquated systems. And so is there a role for us to help them advance digitally, right, in underwriting so that more capital can be deployed in the communities? Um, you know, looking within our, our digital empowerment work, right, you know, we we focus squarely on the digital economy piece, right? That's where that's what Visa does. That's what that's that's Visa's bread and butter. But there are a number of other industries that are leveraging the digital ecosystem. Think of workforce development. Think of telehealth. Think of telemedicine, right? And so, you know, we're beginning to think about, you know, are there other partners that we should be collaborating with? Other private sector entities that we should be collaborating with? To, to loop in, to, to, to bring into the fold, into our broader 
efforts to address digital inequity across the U.S. And so, um, you know, we have we have this network of networks model, right? We have a lot of interesting partners and and, and clients. And so for us, it's 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 great because we get to look across the board and, and see who's doing what and who's doing something interesting and how do we get them looped in and, and bought in. You know, I want to go back to your other hat that you wear, your uh, adjunct professor professor hat. Yeah. You know, and we're going to use Washington, D.C. as an example. Um, it's not a good example these days, but uh, we can let that slide. <laughs> no, but what I want to do is use something else in Washington as an example, since you're a product of that whole general area. As okay. you know, at one point when you were a little, you're a young, young boy, your mom or dad or both of them brought you to see the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, the White House, the Capitol building. But now, as an adult with many experiences behind you, uh, they're the same iconic monuments, but you're a different man. The first day you walked into class, as opposed to when you walk into class now, three years later, you wanted your students to come away with a message or a theme or take away something that you felt was inherently important to the future of this planet that you wanted them to walk out of that class with, even though they all approach the materials differently. You're a different man than you were three years ago, just like we all should be if, if we're going to evolve as humans. But you're teaching still a class of students. What now, today, do you want your students to come away with? And how different is it from your original approach to when you were teaching the, the, first, the first time teaching of your students the first year that you were an adjunct professor at Georgetown? That's uh, a great question. Um, I think me personally, I think it's it's giving students the 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 encouragement, the space to challenge the status quo. I think when you look at the most successful entrepreneurs, the most successful innovators, business leaders, it's always been their ability to see something. And say, hey, just because we've been doing it this way this long doesn't mean that it's the best way or the best approach. Right. And so I I get I get extremely happy, proud when there are students that, that are out there challenging a policy, challenging a a a, a you know a decision matrix for a for a foreign policy case, right? And they're saying, hey why don't we try this way? Or why don't we try that way? And, and I think bringing that outside of the classroom, right, into the professional world as they graduate and, and grow in their own careers, I think, I think will pay dividends, right? I think there is, there is this, there is this comfort in being like, okay, like, we've done it this way, let's, let's keep it and let's, and let's not rock the boat. But, you know, in looking at what challenges we have ahead, both from society, from the environment, I mean, you name it, we can't go the same approach. And so you need people who are challenging, who are who are who are challenging the status quo, who are out there thinking of new solutions, right, for existing problems. Man, I wish I had you as a professor when I was in college, because that that would have been wonderful to walk out of one of my classes learning that lesson. I think that's a beautiful and elegant and important lesson for all of our next generation to learn and thank gosh you're in that role as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. You know what, Worku, you, as you and I know, uh, sustainability, impact work, inclusivity, it, there's no finish line, it's a journey. And I just want you to know that you're always welcome back on the Impact Podcast to share the continued journey that you and your colleagues are on at Visa. It's an important journey. As you say, Visa is a ubiquitous brand around the world. So you have a tremendous and, and important platform that you and your colleagues get to work on for our listeners and viewers to find Worku and his colleagues and the important work they're doing in inclusivity, impact, and sustainability. Please go to www.usa.visa.com. Worku, thank you for your time today. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for your thoughts. And more importantly, thank you and your colleagues for making the world a better place. John, thank you. It's been a pleasure. 
This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking platform revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With thousands of athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent, for speeches, custom experiences, live streams, and much more. For more information on Engage or to book talent today, visit letsengage.com. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States, and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com.